Praise the Lord. We'll be examining the subject standing on our watch. It's a very relevant and important subject for this time. And all the consecrated of the Lord have a responsibility to be watchmen over their lives, watchmen over their families, watchmen over their communities, their nation, and their world. Psalms 134 says, Behold, bless ye the Lord. All ye servants of the Lord, which by night stand in the house of the Lord, all ye ministers of God, who by night stand in the house of the Lord, People are supposed to be sleeping in the night, but these ones stand in the night time in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary. That's a universal sign of surrender unto God and worship, praise. That is the meaning of Judah. Praise with an outstretched arm. Thou art whom thy brethren shall praise. In total surrender, submission to God, to lift up your hands in the sanctuary. The sanctuary is the most holy place. Lift up your hand to the holy place. Lift up your hand in holiness and bless the Lord. That's the meaning of lifting up your hands in the sanctuary. Not necessarily when we come to church. The sanctuary is the most holy place. Is your standing in grace, washed by the blood, empowered by the Holy Spirit. And you stand in that place with your hands lifted up to God's holiness in worship of his glory, in absolute surrender to him. We can be said to have lifted up our hands in the sanctuary to bless, to bless the Lord, to praise, to extol. He says, the Lord that made heaven and earth bless thee out of Zion. When we do that, when we bless him, he blesses us. Oh, glory, hallelujah. For the Lord that made heaven and earth bless thee out of Zion. So as often as you come into God's holy place to lift up your hands in the sanctuary, in the night time when others are sleeping, but you stand by night in the house of the Lord, in the presence of Almighty God, with the hands lifted up to bless him. Then he blesses the land out of his holy hill, Zion. Let's read 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. That's the New Testament counterpart of this word in Psalm 134. 
First Timothy chapter 2. Verse 8, it reads, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubt. Lifting up holy hands without anger, strife, clamoring, evil speaking, without wrath, without doubt, in absolute confidence unto God. On the basis of these two scriptures, I'd like to anchor this message on standing on our watch. That presupposes our calling to the ministry of the watchman. The watchman. And essentially, the watchman stands in his place. Usually at an advantageous spot. In those days, on the rooftop, on an elevation at the city gate, at an advantageous spot. So the watchman must take his place. We are seated in Christ in the heavenly places. We are located in this presence of God, the sanctuary. That's the place of the watchman. It is on God's holy hill, the holy place. That's where the watchman locates. Your standing is very important as a watchman. A watchman cannot stand on the lowland and expect to see things on the mountain top. He stands on an elevated position, the mountain of his holiness, the place of his holiness. So we are told, lift up your hands in the most holy place. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary, in the presence of God, which is Zion, the holy hill. And that's where the watchman is located and is able to exercise his ministry to himself, to his family, to his community, to his nation. When he stands in that place, he looks. That's the next responsibility of the watchman. To look. Most often the prophet said, I said, look. The word of the Lord came saying, son of man, what do you see? You must look. Moses had to turn around to see, to look. Then he saw. So the watchman stands. He looks. He sees. And he declares. That means he has the power of discernment. He's able to understand the nature of objects and entities. So he's not going to be raising a false alarm. He's not going to be seeing trees and then he's saying horsemen are coming because he has mistaken the tree for horsemen. So the capacity to discern the nature of things, objects, 
entities. If that grace of the watchman is not worked in you, when you come into the realm of the spirit, you'll be mistaking things that you see. You will see things you cannot decode, you cannot understand, you cannot relate. But the Lord is going to give us a clear vision, a clear understanding to exercise the ministry of the watchman. Number one, the stand of the watchman. He says, I will stand on my watch, Habakkuk says. The watchtower is an elevated position, advantageous position to enable him to have a view, a panoramic view of the whole situation. I stand on my watch. So where do you stand? Where do you stand? David asked the man to stand and give an account of two men caught in the war. When it was time to give an account, the man said, as thy servant went tida and tida. As thy servant went tida and tida, the man escaped. And he paid for his life. So this is not a time to go tida and tida. You are going to stand on your watch. I will stand on my watch. The watchtower is the holy place of God, the presence of God. So when God says, get into your presence, go, get into my presence, that means go into your closet, shut the door around you and stay in my presence, is a call to the ministry of the watchman. The watchman is a seer. The watchman is also a prophet. And that triple ministry of the watchman, the seer, the prophet is relevant for this time. So that your life will not be invaded. So that you do not have surprise attacks. Because you can keep your guarding. Adam's responsibility was to keep the garden, was to put watch over the garden. By failing to watch, the serpent invaded the garden and brought ruin. So you find reference to angels that kept not their first exit. Angels, messengers that keep their exit shall be your story. An angel that keeps his exit. Not angels that kept not their exit. So you are a watchman, we are watchmen. And then we are to be involved in looking with the intent of seeing. That means we must look. It says, look into Jesus so that we can see him and all the properties of Jesus to be appropriated into our being. So the watchman looks and naturally he sees. When you look, you begin to pay attention. Pay attention. Sometimes God is speaking. But do you hear him? Once has he spoken, twice have I heard him. When God speaks, do you hear? He could speak in several ways. He speaks by his word. He speaks by whispers in your spirit. He speaks by a still, small voice. 
only the perceptive and the attentive can hear a still voice. Praise the name of the Lord. A still voice. Of course, you have to know somebody very well to be able to understand what the person is saying, even if he's not saying anything. He's not physically saying something. You can communicate. When God makes a still voice, do we hear it? But if you look, as I looked, I saw. So the watchman will see, and then the watchman will declare. Praise the name of the Lord. We need watchmen over Zion. Set watchmen upon thy walls, O Zion, Jerusalem. We need watchmen over Nigeria. We need watchmen over the affairs of the world. Now we will turn to Ephesians to begin to highlight the grace, the graces that go along with the ministry of the watchman. It's also needed in the time of crisis and emergencies and wars. When they needed to go into the land to possess it through the administration of Joshua, who had been trained in the art of warfare. He was courageous. He was told to read the book of the law. He was told that that is the secret of being prosperous. And that is where he can have good success. As we found in Joshua chapter 1, verse 6, the Lord said to him, Be strong and of a good courage, for unto these people shall thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swore unto their fathers to give them. It's applicable to you in possessing your own possession. Personally, family-wise, just for anything that is in the borders of the will of God for your life. <clears throat> Only be thou strong and be very courageous <clears throat> that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. So the recipe for success in life. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. In all these <clears throat> endowments, of Joshua. The Lord said to Joshua, you shall stand before Eleazar, the high priest of Israel. Before Joshua executes the law, the, the walls of Canaan, before Joshua enters to lead Israel to possess their possession, by these resources the Lord has provided for him, 
innate in Joshua. He said, stand before Eleazar the high priest. Who will consult the Urim and the Tumim? Who by the judgment of the Urim and the Tumim shall determine how you go? The Urim and the Tumim is a material in the garment of the high priest of Israel. The particular aspect of that garment is called the effort. The effort. It is also called the breastplate of judgment. The breastplate of judgment. That means the breastplate of discernment. And the object within the breastplate that enables judgment or discernment is the urim and the tumim. There are some precious stones, which simply means, urim simply means light. Tumim means perfection. Light and perfection. That means the Lord does not want us to have partial light, but he wants us to be fully enlightened. In any matter that relates to our redemption, our well-being, our progress in life, the Lord wants to give us all that is required for life and godliness. And so for Joshua to lead Israel to have all of their inheritance, he must seek counsel of the Urim and the Tumim. That means he must stand before a priest and the priest will consult the effort. Remember when David was many times in the wilderness and in very bare situations, he will say, bring me the effort. One typical situation was when they were in Ziglag. As a matter of fact, they suffered a calamity and their children and their wives we are taken by the enemy to unknown destination. 400 fighters lost in a moment everything they had in life. And they had no idea where these precious things had been taken to. And they began to weep. The Bible says they wept until they, they had no more power to weep. And David began to encourage himself in the Lord, just like the Lord told Joshua, be strong and be courageous. It is my intention to give you the land so that you can share this inheritance to Israel. But in doing that, you must seek the counsel of the Urim and the Tumim to be administered by the priest Eleazar. So after David and his men cried and couldn't cry anymore, David, we are told, began to encourage himself in the Lord. And suddenly David said, bring me the effort. The effort is the breastplate of judgment. And he began to inquire. So David, at that stage, was combining the ministry of priest, king, and prophet. He began to inquire of the Lord. He said, shall we go? The Lord said, yes, you should go. Should, shall we pursue them? He said, pursue them. Will we recover them? He said, you will recover everything. It was the guidance of the Urim and the Tumim, the light and perfection. The way it works, we are told, is that when you consult it, if something is completely true without any error, it, it's a perfect lighting. It lights from one end to the other. Completely true. If something is partially true but has elements of untruth, 
It lights partially and the remaining part remains dark. If something is not true at all, it's dark. That's the way the Urim and the Tulim works. Lights and perfection. Light unto perfection. Not hazy, not seeing men like trees. Or hearing God, but not, you know, it's so mixed up. So there must be a clarity about your spirit man, about your environment. Moses saw the Lord. He says he saw him as the body of heaven in clearness. It is also called the crystal sea. The sea of glass, clear as crystal. That is where this man stood in the book of Revelation to prophesy to nations. They prophesy on clear grounds. There is a ministry of prophecy coming on the earth. It shall be the unveiling. With unveiled face, we behold as in a glass the glory of the Lord. Hallelujah. Blessed be God forever. Jesus moved in that realm. And there was nothing hidden before him. He knew all men. Nobody need to tell him about man, for he knew what was in man. Oh, glory, hallelujah. There is a clear ground. And you can come into that clear ground. Amen. And so you are not going to be tricked by any con man. You are not going to be confused by anything. If something is potentially dangerous, as, as the men walk close to you, you begin to know what is right in their heart. You perceive, you, you can understand. That's the power of discernment. Necessary for warfare and for victories and for the administration of the inheritance in Jesus Christ. And that is the grace of the watchman who stands before God to look, to see, to discern the nature of things accurately and to declare the word of the Lord. May the word of the Lord come to us clearly, giving direction, making Israel know what ought to be done, just like the men of Issachar. The Bible says that they had understanding of the times. And it was their responsibility to make Israel know what to do at any time. Do you have an understanding of the times and the seasons that you are in? Do you know, is the church aware what she should be doing? Or is the global church confused about what's happening? Oh, what happens? Okay, there is a global vaccine mandate. It's coming. Everybody's mandated. What shall we do? If it, if, if, if it comes to a national mandate in Nigeria, if they say you cannot report back to your job without a vaccine, what shall you do? If it, 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 there are scenarios that will play out that will put the people of God in utter confusion as sheep without shepherd, but they must be guided. You must know. I don't even think there is a general counsel and guide for the whole church to, do, to respond to a certain way. There could be certain members of the church the Lord will allow to take, to take whatever they want to give them. It depends on their level of faith and their capacity to handle certain things. There could be others who must say no to the very end. And for a purpose, but this global thing coming around the world must be resisted. It must collapse. It is the game plan of Lucifer to control the whole world. They control you in this. You think it is just a matter of public health. You are mistaken. Eventually, they will control you on the matters of your faith. And by the time it has to do with your faith in God and you, and you have willingly submitted to all controls, you can only retain your faith by being beheaded completely. No other choice. Because you have no defense systems. But anyway, I believe 
We should begin to resist because the Lord has spoken, not because I'm just thinking. Over three decades ago, I knew prophetically that that is the lot of the world, controls of the world system. The Lord said, he used Genesis 11, that he will come down to see this city and the tower which the sons of men are building. And that it is not going to be a static event, a once event as recorded in Genesis 11. It will be a successive coming down. And he will keep coming down to disrupt the unity of the world to have one language. To disrupt it until the final fall and collapse of civilization. For every coming down of the Lord will be a collapse of the things that bind men together until finally civilization as we know it will crumble like a pack of cards before a mighty tornado. Because out of that ruin shall arise a new heaven and a new earth. There was a stone that came from a high mountain, Zion, that smote the image of Nebuchadnezzar. One government, that was the, that was the empire, of course, pronounced empire over the earth. Babylon, Persia, greco Romans, the present empire system led by the United States of America, okay, with the drum beaten by Britain. This empire system will collapse eventually and it shall be catastrophic, much more catastrophic than the fall of Humpty Dumpty. All the king's horsemen, all the king's army, could not put Humpty Dumpty together again. Nothing is going to put back this civilization when it collapses. And the stone shall begin to grow. According to the book of Daniel, it shall grow until it becomes a mountain that fills the whole world. God's government is the end of history. Amen. Nations ruled by the law of Almighty God. For the law will go forth out of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. That's the end. But before such an, an end is realized, there will be satanic controls, attempts to galvanize the world in various ways. Today is public health. Tomorrow is going to be climate change. And the next time it could be sustainable development. Another time it could be global terrorism. There must be something that we are, they are going to use. To bring the whole world to one language and one speech. But the Lord will keep looking down. Amen. He will keep coming down. And he will confound their language. But what do we do? That's the point I'm making. Discernment. You, the spirit of the watchman must be in place in the church. So you as an individual, to begin to understand how to organize your life. I don't want to say so much. In a broad way, the Lord had already begun to say certain things to the church for some time now. But you know what? It's only when push comes to show that we will know how important it is. Sometimes you, you may not know yet until the time comes closer. One of which is to consider underground churches. It may not be apparent, but it will be apparent at the appointed time. The other is to learn the grace of subsistence living. To live subsistently. I mean, to live, I mean, subsistently. Subsistence living. That means living on the barest minimum, just the essentials. There's this present lifestyle of high level of consumerism, acquisition, property. You know, people are just taking everything. The Lord said to me, we need to learn the grace of subsistence living. As the Lord begins to help you, Think about it. When you think of the future on how to organize your life, don't think of property and materials and acquisition of things around you. Think of living a life that does not need the exchange economy. 
the subsistence farmer had everything around him necessary for his survival. He was not farming to market. Do you understand? Anytime the farmer begins to exchange his crops and get into the market economy, he's no longer subsistence. He will be living, in fact, you will discover that his crops, his farm begins to change from intercrops to monocrops. Maybe they need cotton somewhere there, and cotton is giving so much money, he will eliminate all the small, small crops he grows for daily survival and grow cotton only so that he can get plenty of money and he can use that money to do other things. Maybe it's his cocoa or oil farm or some monocrops. But the subsistence farmer grows onion, tomato, pepper, everything that he can get. The spices he needs, the protein he needs, the, 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 the vegetables, the vitamins, everything around. Because he doesn't market it. And the excess he gives out to friends, just enough for his need. It's just a model. I'm not saying that we will go back to agriculture. It's a model that you will begin to organize your life such a way as to give you everything you need. Your water should not be dependent on public supply. Your food, your protein should not be dependent on public supply. And so many, even your health systems, your energy systems, should not be dependent on public supply. We are coming to a world, Lucifer will control all supply outlets, and in fact, he will control the exchange economy. That's where the beast goes. It's, the Bible has already told us, without submitting to the mark of the beast in your hand or forehead, that means in your walk, in the, your hand is what you do. Your forehead is how you think. You cannot buy or sell. You will not be allowed to buy or sell. You have to think the, the way the beast wants you to think. And you have to do what the beast wants you to do. Otherwise, you will not buy or sell. That is the, that is the, that is the world to come. That's the way it's coming. It's playing out everywhere. And that is what it was in the old Roman time. Before they entered the Roman market, you have to acknowledge that Caesar is God. And then there were this group of persons who knew that Jesus is Lord. And that brought them into collision conflict with the Roman Empire. That is how they began to persecute Christians. Because they refused to acknowledge that Caesar is God. If you don't acknowledge, you're not entering that market, you're not going to buy, you're not going to sell. You must think the way the beast wants you to think. You must do what the beast wants you to do. If the beast says, kneel down, you kneel down. If the beast says, now it's time for mandate, we all go. If, oh, you cannot enter an airline, so, so, so exactly, sir. You cannot enter a restaurant, I surrender, sir. Uh, you keep submitting. So long as you are willing to submit, the people who command must continue to command. They will have a permanent incentive to command, so long as you are willing to submit. So I am happy to see how the Lord is even bringing a political divide. Some group of people are resisting, some are accepting it to your advantage. If they, call, if they are won, you understand? If they are completely won, they will come for you, and there's nothing you can do. They will come for you because your governments are small, small governments. They will come for you. So we can see you know, some opposition going on, even in the heart of Europe. Let it continue. Hallelujah. Because the Lord will always come down to see the city and the Torah, which the sons of men are doing, and it, the Lord will continue to bring disruptive forces. 